I told you to leave the water heater alone, Infotron. Oh, hi. You caught me punishing my robot, Infotron. Speaking of bad robots, let's talk about the comic Scud the Disposable Assassin. Don't you ever do that again. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. You know, today I want to talk about one of my favorite independent comics from the 90s. I fell in love with independent, self-published, and just alternative comics in the mid to late 80s with books like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and The Tick. And when it came to the 90s, uh, there weren't quite as many. A lot of the smaller press publishers from the 80s collapsed in the 90s. Uh, mainstream comics became more and more popular, and companies like Marvel, DC, uh, Valiant, Image, Dark Horse, were publishing more titles than they had in the past. That meant they were employing more creators, so less people were doing their own side projects. One of the most prominent 90s books I can think of that I was reading at the time was Bone. But aside from that, one book that I'd always keep an eye out for was Scud the Disposable Assassin by Rob Schraub. It's been a true pleasure following his career and those that he brought with him. And I just want to talk today about what makes Scud the Disposable Assassin and the work of Rob Schraub quite so special. According to the introduction in the collected edition of Scud the Disposable Assassin, creator Rob Schraub was motivated to start his comic in the aftermath of a painful breakup. And that's apt because the book is all about broken people and misfits looking to find their place in the world. The central character is named Scud, and as the title describes, he is a disposable assassin. The book features some corporate penny pinchers at Marvin's Mannequins trying to deal with a monster they've been keeping that has broken loose and is eating their employees. An underling buys a Scud out of a vending machine to take out this monster. But along the way, Scud realizes that he will self-destruct upon completing his assignment. So instead of killing his target, he shoots off the monster's limbs and puts her on life support. Life support isn't cheap, so Scud takes on assassin jobs to keep paying for his target's medical bills. As you can probably guess, Scud is not only bizarre, but is also very funny. Uh, his target, Jeff, is an utterly unique patchwork monster. She has mouths on her knees, uh, mouse traps for hands, a giant squid attached to her chest, and a plug for a head. But that's just the way Scud as a comic rolls. It's a world where anything can happen. There are robots, there are aliens, there are monsters like werewolves and zombies, and eventually there's even angels and demons. Anything goes. The character of Scud is a pretty easygoing guy who is essentially born fully formed. He seems to understand pop culture references right away, is confident in his skills, and comfortable with his profession. And he makes friends easily, including Tony Tasty and the Lacosa Nostroid Mafia family, and Drywall, a sack-like sidekick full of zippers that open to hold nearly anything. Scud is agile and proficient with all manner of weapons, and focused on living his life with the cards he's been dealt instead of wallowing in self-pity about his tough life. He seems to represent the type of hard-working, lovable, and creative person creator Rob Schraub would like to be, and I base that on Scud's love of pop culture and his signature broken heart emblem on his chest, representing his facade that hides his heartbreak. Schraub created the character in 1994 and started up his own studio, Fireman Press, to self-publish out of his home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. While every issue is illustrated by Schraub, some of the issues are written or co-written with his friends Mondi Carter and Dan Harmon. All three were members of a local improv troupe known as the Dead Alewives. Rob introduced some spin-off one-shots and miniseries about supporting cast members, including a Lacosa Nostroid series written by Dan Harmon, which never ended up seeing completion. One of the things I love about Scud is it's a mashup of genres. It's got horror and romance and action and comedy. And Schraub wears his influences on his sleeve. It's obvious that he loves things like Robocop, 
Doctor Who, Dawn of the Dead, and maybe even the sort of do-it-yourself aesthetic of googly-eyed Muppets. In fact, Schraub later made a short movie called Robot Bastard that was a balls-to-the-wall action piece featuring a robot battling monsters on a space station. The robot is the kind of thing you can make at home with cardboard, paint, and lights, but the action is rock-solid and very reminiscent of what you can read in Scud. One fantastic part of the Scud series is that every supporting character is interesting and feels like they could support their own comic. In fact, several do, like Drywall, Tony Tasty, and Oswald, a previous Scud model with a rabbit head that Rob Schraub has said is based on Jackson, the green rabbit alien from Marvel's Star Wars comics. Drywall is a lovable sidekick, and the love interest and villains are also unique. One of the main antagonists is Voodoo Ben, who is a futuristic version of Ben Franklin, the founding father, who is not only a technological genius, but has mastered the occult arts and made a deal with the devil to stay alive. He has an army of zombies, which he utilizes to go after Scud and the Lacosa Nostroid crime family. He creates zombie dinosaurs because they have smaller brains and are thus harder to kill. He eventually hires Susudio, a female assassin, to take down Scud, but she falls in love with him as she is an admitted robosexual. For me, Scud is inspirational. It came out at a time when I was excited about comics, and it made me feel like it was the kind of thing that maybe I could do myself if I just put in the hard work. And I'm not talking about just the fact that it was self-published. It's that if I could critique it for a moment, sometimes you look at the artwork and you're like, okay, well that isn't perfect anatomy and the perspective on backgrounds may not be perfect. But that just meant that you felt like that's the kind of thing you might do yourself if you were in the same situation drawing this story. And who cares? Because I can put that aside and say, those are legit critiques, but I look at the artwork and it's dynamic, it's engaging, it's easy to follow, and I legit cared about the characters in this story. That's important. While Scud is a very fun book that has extended action scenes regularly, it also wasn't afraid to go dark. It felt incredibly personal, even if it wasn't always clear exactly what Schraub was going through. The book went for 20 issues between 1994 and 1998, and the last year or so, the issues came out quite slowly. The last issue or two were extra dark, and in 2006, Rob blogged about how depressed and stressed out he was at the time. It shows. Scud loses someone close to him in a very violent way, and agrees to kill the Earth for the corrupt angels of heaven. The book built to a very apocalyptic storyline years ahead of, say, Preacher, which used similar mythology. In 1997, Hollywood came calling. Director Oliver Stone's company approached Rob and optioned Scud to be a live-action movie. Rob decided to move to Hollywood because his ultimate goal was to be a filmmaker. His friend Dan Harmon came along. While the Scud movie never ended up getting made, it did allow Harmon and Schraub to meet folks in Hollywood and develop some ideas. They co-wrote the animated movie Monster House, which came out years later. They also filmed a pilot for a show called Heat, Vision, and Jack. It starred Jack Black as an astronaut exposed to solar radiation, who becomes a genius during the day and a bit of an idiot at night. The government wants to experiment on him, so he goes on the run with his roommate, who is transformed into a talking motorcycle voiced by Owen Wilson. The entire episode was directed by Ben Stiller, and it's usually available on YouTube. Fans of Scud, like myself, loved it, but we wondered when Scud would get wrapped up. Issue 20 was a cliffhanger, and we went years without hearing anything about it. Finally, almost 10 years after the last issue had come out, Rob decided that he was in a better place and he wanted to wrap up the story. So in 2008, he published four more issues through Image Comics. It continued and wrapped up the story of Scud. I don't want to spoil it for you, but for fans of the comic, at least for this fan, I think it resolves in a very satisfying way. Uh, it was great that it finally came back, and Schraub promoted it in a number of creative ways, my favorite being a cartoon by Justin Roiland. You see, one thing Rob Schraub and Dan Harmon created when they moved to L.A. was a monthly short film festival called Channel 101. 
People could pitch five-minute TV shows, and the best would go head-to-head -head with the audience voting and the top five continuing the following month. Schraub created shows like Twigger's Holiday, and Dan Harmon made Laser Fart. A number of other talented creators found their way into Hollywood by making shows for Channel 101, including Justin Roiland, who made animated shows like House of Cosby's. He would go on to make one called Doc and Marty, based on the characters from Back to the Future. In one special episode, they promoted the fact that Scud was coming back. To a close. Wow, that's pretty great, Doc. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, it's great. Now look, Marty. Look what I found outside our house, Marty. Oh no! It's real! Scud, it's real, Marty. It's real! No! It's not just a comic book. Oh god, it's real! Get ready! The whole world's gonna die, Marty. Because Scud is real, Marty. It's real! I can't believe it's real! Scud is real, Marty. It's real! It's real! It's real, Marty. It's not just a comic Scud is book. real, oh, Marty. It's real! Scud is it's real. real! Oh no! Scud it's is real, real Marty. It's real! As you can see from the clip, this was an early version of what would evolve into Rick and Morty, co-written and produced by Dan Harmon. Schraub became busy developing the Sarah Silverman program and working as a producer, writer, and director on that for several years before finding the time to wrap up Scud. Scud the Disposable Assassin really stood out to me in the 90s because it was the antithesis to everything else that was coming out in the 90s from publishers like Image and Marvel. I mean, these companies were using huge events and fancy coloring techniques, things like that, nicer paper, and I don't know, it was just completely different to be reading a black and white comic that felt very, very personal. So it really stood out and it was always a treat when you would see a new issue on the shelves. The book is decidedly not mainstream, but at the same time, I think it's incredibly accessible. Because it's a mashup of genres, there's a great chance you'll connect with at least one aspect of it. Maybe some people will be turned off by the artwork, because that comes down to individual taste. I really enjoy it personally, but your mileage may vary. The book comments on the incredible power and abuse thereof that can be found in capitalism. It shows how religion can be full of hypocrisy. But it isn't like it goes out of its way to slam something or get preachy. It just feels like a completely unfiltered flow of ideas out of creator Rob Schraub's brain. And he's a really funny, entertaining guy. The best part of all is that if you lost track of reading it in the 90s or haven't come across it yet, you can now read the entire story in Image's compilation, The Whole Shebang. Scud is an assassin, but fortunately, he never gets sent after anyone that's a good person. Instead, he lives in a world full of corruption, and everyone is at least a shade of gray. Everyone Scud goes after is absolutely evil, from cult leaders to the horsemen of the apocalypse. Despite being an assassin, Scud was designed to be the opposite of everything else on the stands at the time. Schraub said in an interview on the Sci-Fi Channel's Gravity Room that he found superheroes were incredibly powerful but were always morose and depressed about their lives and who they lost. So Scud was created to be the opposite of that. Instead of bursting with muscles, he's a skinny, plain robot with big, cartoony eyes and bright colors. He loves his life, at least most of the time, and that's why he'll go to incredible lengths not to be disposable. In case it's not obvious, I'm a big fan of Rob Schraub. I make no bones about it. Um, you know, if I'm going to complain about stuff, I'll admit, you know, his artwork may not be for everyone, and humor is subjective, so you may not find it as funny as I do. But this is something I've always enjoyed, and I have loved following his career. Rob Schraub will frequently show up these days on the Harmontown podcast. I laugh out loud at this guy's improv. I think his shtick is incredibly Funny. He's directed episodes of shows that I really like, like uh, Community and Parks and Rec. I loved his uh, show, The Sarah Silverman Program. He co-created that show. It's a pretty out there, bizarre show. Uh, anything can happen. It's hilarious. I, I just really find the guy charming. And I think what I like most about Rob Schraub is that he created his own opportunities by self-publishing a comic book. That's what got him noticed and allowed him to move to Hollywood and start to fulfill his dreams. So I find that incredibly inspirational and aspirational. Uh, 
really, really cool. Uh, I think that the um, whole shebang is a pretty good vol uh, value. Uh, it's about $35 for um, the 24 issues of Scud, and I believe there's at least two one-shots also in this drywall, and I believe one about Susudio, the female assassin. So that's pretty good, you know, 26 issues at least for $35. It is black and white, but um, a lot of that has some really nice screen tones. I like that. I'm attracted to this artwork. Uh, if you uh, are interested, I would also recommend looking for Rob Schraub's Scud Vlogs, which he has here on YouTube. Anyway, that's a lot out of me. Let's take a quick look at what kind of fan art came in this week. I have two great pieces this week. The first comes from John Dupree. It features me flying through the Seattle skies, and what do you know, I'm saying, oh hi, you caught me flying. Speaking of flying, fantastic work, John. Thank you very much. Next up is this fun piece by Gustavo Gama. It features me trying out, probably for something like the Legionnaires. They're asking me what my name and powers are. And I say, I'm Captain Comic Tropes. I analyze comic books and drink... And, of course, I don't have pants on. Thank you, Gustavo. There's his Instagram, if you are so inclined. All right, with two people, let's do a coin flip. Heads will be John Dupree. Tails will be Gustavo Gama. Flip it, catch it, okay, and it is heads. John, you won the Gachapon prize this week. That's right. If you would like to have your artwork featured on this channel, just make sure that it's fan art somehow related to this show and send it to this address, comictropes at gmail.com, and you might even win a Gachapon prize. Uh, if you want your um, social media to be included, just be sure to uh, include that when you send it along. Let's see what we got here from the Lunar Shines Gotcha Pony Machine. Thank you very much for that. I'm reaching in here. There is a prize. What is it? Ah, I can't quite grab it. All right. All right, let's see. It's in a bigger ball. I gotta pop this out. We have... I cannot quite tell. Oh! That's a Gudetama egg. Gudetama is a lazy, depressed egg. He just cannot find the motivation to get up. I relate to Gudetama. In case I haven't uh, made it clear, I absolutely suffer from depression, pretty seriously. I have to take medication, I have to try to eat well, get exercise, socialize, keep busy. It's hard to deal with. It's a challenge. It's a constant challenge every day. But you know what helps, honestly? Making this show. It keeps me very busy. I find it very rewarding. Uh, anyway, John, send me your contact uh, info, like a mailing address, and I will send you this Gudetama egg. Congratulations on that. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Maybe a little shorter than some of the others, but I know that the next two episodes are definitely going to be ones that everybody's into, because first I'm talking about sort of spin-off or derivative superheroes, characters like Spider-Gwen, Miles Morales, She-Hulk, Spider-Woman, uh, Supergirl, etc. You know, all these characters that came from a bigger character. Like, how did that become a thing? Why is that a thing? Why do companies create them? Maybe the answers are somewhat obvious, but I think we'll have some interesting news there. And then after that, I mean, I gotta talk about Aquaman. We've got an Aquaman movie right around the corner, so that's coming up. Anyway, that's plenty from me. Thank you for watching, and until next time... Keep reading comics.